I didn't complete it last year. Because I lost the story, I lost the film. And I'm going to go back and get it again. That's what two Brits decided to do this summer as they began a six month adventure. This is from Japan all the way to San Francisco. Two men decide to roll across the ocean just to see if they can do it. Not about that much. Two hours, rowing two hours, 24 7. And this is strictly manpower. Opened the hatch to find uh, the cabin pretty much full of smoke. It comes alive when he's out there, and he's good at it as well. I love being on the ocean, Christmas adventures. No one's ever done it before. They go very big waves. It's the hardest session I've ever been through with the wrist. It's probably been out here forever. <laughs> <laughs> Can't go on to this sport, haven't I? <laughs> now, this route is a war of attrition. It's just you've got to get out of it so long. Volleyball's been cancelled. <laughs> That place will kill you if you get it wrong. Very short food. And we're tired. And we're hungry and thin. We got some wind problems from rough seas and they got off that. Freezing and soaking wet. It's quite tough. They uh, have run out of provisions, they have no food, they're hungry. I'm absolutely done. First time I've really considered that we're not going to get in. The North Pacific is going to be crazy. <laughs> Thank you. So I'd like to just understand a little bit more about your uh, background in terms of understanding ocean rowing. Hands up anybody who's heard about ocean rowing as a sport or a, a thing that people have done. Keep your hands up if you have heard about people rowing the Atlantic. Hands up if you know anybody who's rowed the Pacific. <laughs> My brother has, and my fiance. Um, okay, so, and, and that was very much uh, the state of affairs for me when I first heard about uh, ocean rowing. I'd been a rower at school, um, and I'd heard about the Atlantic Rowing Race, and I thought, hey, that sounds like something I'd like to do. Um, and in 2005, uh, that was what I decided to do. I decided to row from the Canary Islands to Antigua, across the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, this was the boat I decided to do it in because it was really cheap. Um, it's, uh, it's made of plywood, it's got a cabin at each end, the stern cabin has a bed in, uh, the electrics are powered by solar panels, um, and essentially it's pretty basic. There's not a great amount of facilities on board, and also because I used uh, quite an old boat, quite a lot of the systems on board were second hand, they were um, maybe maybe not the, the newest, and so things sort of broke while I was uh, on board, uh, including the rudder, uh, which snapped in half. Um, the, the end of the blue here indicates where the water line is, and so that's the useful bit of rudder that isn't there. So one of the lessons that I learned on the Atlantic is that there's always a solution to any given problem that you can come up with and and this was my solution was to take some bits of wood from underneath the bed 
uh, strap on some extra bits of metal that I had which were uh, spare knocking around and fashion an extra bit of rudder. Um, that wasn't the only thing that broke, I also broke all my oars in a, in a capsize, uh, the GPS broke and I had to uh, weld or solder the connections back together using a, a Caligas stove and a, and a nail. Um, it's not a brilliant solution but it did work. And, and all the way through an awful lot of little things broke and happened uh, and you just got to find a way through it and believe that there is a solution. And if you keep on trying and never give up, eventually you'll get to the end. Um, and after 68 days of being on my own, uh, I got into Antigua in English Harbour with a great beard, uh, a fantastic tan. Um, I was a little bit lighter, um, but it was the most amazing experience. And I knew then that I wanted to go back out and do something else. I didn't exactly know what that was, but I knew that an opportunity would eventually present itself. Now, in 2004, this man, Mick Dawson, decided that he would try and row across the North Pacific. He'd already rowed the Atlantic with his brother three years earlier, um, and he wanted to go out and row across the North Pacific from Japan to San Francisco. Uh, this was Mick on day one. Um, Mick didn't have the best trip. Uh, this is his second attempt at the North uh, Pacific. His first one, his uh, rudder, uh, got snapped off about 500 miles out of Japan. He took the sensible decision to turn around and come back in again. So this time, 2004, he's like, right, this time I'm going to make it. I've made all these improvements. Let's go. Uh, unfortunately, this is Mick on day 103. Um, his boat capsized. Uh, a wave got into the the main hatch, water got in, the boat capsized, it didn't self right again, that's it, it's game over. So he uh, pushed himself out the door, got into his life raft, set off his emergency positioning beacon, and it was a matter of 16 hours before somebody got to him. Um, but thankfully, they did manage to pluck him out of the water, and I, you cannot imagine how gutting, I, I can't imagine how gutting that feels. Um, after 103 days at sea, on your own, you've got past, you're over halfway, and then that happens. Oh, that's got to be gutting. Um, but Mick's greatest strength is his ability to just accept that and say, OK, this is what happened. I'm not going to cry about it much, um, but I'm going to move on and, and let's look at the future. So I met Mick in a pub in Antigua because he jumped into another boat in the Atlantic rowing race, the same one that I was in, um, with two days notice after somebody uh, dropped out. Uh, he then raced across with this, uh, with another guy in a double, um, and they actually beat me in. Well, I, mean, I was solo, so what could I do? Uh, <laughs> despite his two days of preparation, um, I met Mick in a pub, and he said, hey, what do you reckon to rowing across the North Pacific with me? I reckon we can do this. And, and I was like, well, you know what I could do, but I've got, uh, I can't do this now because I've got uh, sort of commitments. I've got, a, I've just got back in. My mum had never let me. Um, I don't have the time to do it. I mean, it's so long. It's, uh, and well, my back hurt so much last time. I, I'm physically drained. I couldn't possibly be able to do that. And, and hell, I'm not rich. I don't have enough money. And all of these sort of excuses just circle around fear. And that's all it is, is it's just, you're just afraid to try and make something happen. And once you take that fear away, you can find the, you can find the time, you can find a way to manage those commitments that you might have, like a job. Uh, you can find the money through sponsorship. You can, you can do uh, sort of stretches and exercises to make sure you don't have back pain next time. Um, and anything is possible, absolutely anything is possible. But you do have to stretch a little bit further, a little bit higher than you might expect that you could do. I have no idea how this duckling got. How does it do that? If I try to do that, I'll fall over. Um, <laughs> and and you just got to believe in yourself. And when you do those three things, you just got to aim. Anything is possible if you believe in yourself and if you reach a little higher. And so after about six months of me saying yes, oh no. 
Yes, no, I, I can't possibly do this. Okay, right, that's it, I'm definitely in. No, 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 I'm out. It's just too big, I don't have any money. It's not going to happen. Um, I eventually said yes. Okay, Mick, that's it. Tell me what we're going to do. And he said, well, this is the plan. We're going to take this ocean rowing boat, stuff it full of six months' worth of food. Uh, we're going to take a whole load of new, strong, thicker, bigger oars so they don't break. Uh, we've learnt all these lessons from what has happened previously and which what problems people have had. Um, and we go row 5,000 miles across the Great Circle route um, from Japan to San Francisco. It should take about four and a half months. Brilliant, Mick. I'm in. The reality may be slightly different to what I was expecting. Um, our route ended up covering 7,000 miles uh, and taking just over six months. Six months is a long time. 189 days ago today was the 29th of October. That's like a couple of months before Christmas. And we're like in summer now. You know, that, that's an awfully long period of time to be at sea with one other person <laughs> for that whole period. We didn't see anybody else. Um, and it's not particularly inviting. It's a relatively hostile environment. So we knew what had happened previously, we knew Mick's problems uh, that he had encountered, we knew my problems uh, that I'd encountered on my Atlantic trip, and we knew the problems that we would have to overcome in order to make this dream and this plan uh, a reality. And we knew it was probably going to be tougher than we expected, but if you plan for the worst and hope for the best, then somewhere along that sort of continuum, you'll pop out in, in good form. So, learning from those mistakes, we built a brand new boat, did away with the plywood boats. Right, okay, this is carbon and Kevlar. It's got 50 kilos of lead down the hull. Um, so if we capsize, even if the catch is open, it will self-right. There's pretty much no way that this is gonna stay the wrong way up. Uh, we're gonna give her sleek lines, so any waves that hit her are gonna bounce off and roll over the top. We're gonna give her a nice paint job because then people will want to sponsor us. Um, and then we're going to stick a whole load of solar panels on because we know that even though you do your little calculation saying that if there's an average of eight hours of sunlight a day and each of my solar panels gets this many watts of power and that will charge the batteries this much, you won't get half of that by the time it actually works out to what it's going to be like, especially as you get in towards winter. Um, we arrived in November, so... Uh, there's no way your calculations can expect that. So you just keep throwing solar panels on the boat to make sure you're covered as much as possible. And then you give her another lick of paint so she looks even nicer. Um, and then you give her some nice comfy rowing positions to sit in. This is a nice lambswool seat. Perfect for sitting on. Um, and then you do up the inside so you, it's nice and comfy and it's bright and it's clean. It was never ever this clean again. Um, and then with a couple of weeks to go, you think, well, you should probably get in the water and give her a quick test. Uh, unfortunately, at this stage, Mick was out in Nigeria working. Um, so it was left down to me to realise that, oh yeah, that, that hole in the bottom of the boat that has a little uh, uh, thermometer on top of it so we can tell what temperature the water is, that's, that's really important for us. We, we have to have that. However, that does leak actually, so we need to do something about that. Um, but a, a successful water trial, she floated, all the systems sort of worked and spoke to each other. And, and so a couple of weeks, well, it's uh, about two and a half months after this photo was taken, this photo was taken when we push off and disappear over the horizon uh, from Choshi. Horrendous visibility and really quite busy seas. Um, Choshi is a peninsula that sticks out into the North Pacific Ocean, just uh, northeast of Tokyo. So all the boats and shipping that's coming across the North Pacific, they come in and they dip. They have to dip underneath Choshi Peninsula before being able to get into Tokyo Harbour, which is it's a good thing because it means they're all really close together. So after so about twelve hours of rowing, we've passed through five shipping lines, uh, lanes of shipping. Um, and then we're out more or less into open ocean. Doesn't mean those first 12 or so hours are pretty hairy and there are some, and this is a small boat, um, but they appear in an instant 
they whiz straight past you and they disappear into the, the haze and the, the poor visibility. It's not particularly bright, sunny, nice, clean. You're only three feet off the water, so even if you stand up, you know, maybe it's five feet and you can see three miles. Now one of these is moving at sort of 30 knots and that'll appear in, well, I don't know, say you've got a three minutes between when you see it first on the horizon and when it when it hits you and runs you over. So you've really got to be aware of that. And we've got some systems on the boat to try and mitigate that and try and make sure that we're as safe as possible. Um, but uh, a Mark 1 eyeball is definitely the best uh, safety unit on board. And they get bigger as you go across because you get the more sort of intercontinental type shipping. And and the worst thing is when they start to point directly at you and or you can't really see a side of a boat, which is the easy thing to see because it's, it's big. When you see just the bridge coming towards you, then you know you've got some serious concerns and you need to start moving quite quickly in order to, to overcome that. Um, but it isn't just shipping that's out or standard shipping that's out there. Um, this is what we call Dr. Evil's Lair. It's a, it's a research vessel, a US research vessel. Um, this researches, uh, using its 1,800 ton radar on top, um, any, is it any, uh, object bigger than a baseball fired or thrown from Japan, uh, China, Korea, Asia, uh, anywhere in Asia, Russia, anything like that, towards the United States. This thing is huge and it moves. I thought this, it looks like some stationary oil rig type object. This thing just fired up its engines after lunchtime when we saw it and disappeared over the horizon. This was the first photo I sent home as soon as, I, uh, as, soon as I'd seen it because I was like, quick if if people won't believe this and also i've seen the x-files i know what happens i know these conspiracy theories we won't wake up tomorrow if i don't let people know about it just really bizarre things that you see out there um and that sort of covers off the the human element of danger for us uh, and this is the more natural element of danger we saw some pretty severe waves the north pacific is about three times as wide as the Atlantic, so it gets a good chance to pick up some really big storms um, that do come through. A couple of days out, we were hitting 40 knot winds um, and some significant wave heights to go with that, sort of higher than these teepees easily. Sometimes they're gentle, big rolling swells, more than likely on the North Pacific. Um, nothing is blowing in the same direction for very long at all, so it's breaking waves and that's when it gets slightly dangerous but you can make the best out of those breaking waves and the scary situation of having them if you stick the stern of the boat into those waves then you can actually surf the swell and instead of looking side on to this breaking big breaking storm that actually looks quite scary if you get the stern into it and, and ride it in the correct way you can actually get a real good shove on it and make some extra miles towards your destination. Um, I think this sort of can be translated into anything. Sometimes there's always a good, some good that comes out of a bad situation, um, and it's just being able to identify that. So waves may appear scary and, and terrifying, but sometimes you can make a a good good headway because of that. But it wasn't always horrendously scary and big waves. Sometimes it's pan flat. Um, now, albatross sort of rely on the wind in order to, to fly properly. They're sort of massive wingspan. They need that to be able to soar. And they are the most magnificent, beautiful and graceful creatures you can ever imagine when they're in the sky. When they try and land or take off, they it's just chaos. It's absolute chaos. And it's even more fun when there's no wind because they've got nothing to give them a helping hand to take off. Uh, and landing is equally... One of them nearly T-boned our boat, actually, just because he completely cocked up the landing and <laughs> just sort of ran into our boat. Like, you all right? What are you doing? <laughs> just bizarre. 
But yeah, uh, you don't have to be an expert at everything, but being an expert at something definitely helps. Uh, and there was also huge amounts of wildlife underwater. Uh, we had three fin whales, um, quite juveniles, quite small. They're only 35 foot long, so they're only 10 foot longer than the boat. Um, each of them must have been about 40 tons, something like that. And they were swimming and essentially inquisitive about us. Um, I wouldn't say they were playing with the boat, but Mick did run one over when it got a little bit too close playing a game of chicken. Uh, and there are some really ugly creatures out there in the North Pacific. Um, and there's a sunfish here as well on the right hand side. <laughs> this is one of those creatures that Darwin clearly didn't see when he was coming up with his, his fantastic theory of evolution. It looks like a Doctor Who creature. It's got a human head ish on the front, and this is sort of an eye here. This is leathery skin. It's got a fin up here. It's got a fin down the bottom. They grow up to, the body grows up to two meters in diameter, and each fin can be up to two meters. So that's six meters of fish. And you think, oh, they must have some, they must do something fantastic. They must hunt things. They must, how do they get this big? And apparently their de defence mechanism is that they taste horrible. So, which is the reason we weren't char cooked dinner. They have no ability to go fast whatsoever. They sort of just flop and lie. And I think they're called sunfish because they just sort of lie and sunbathe most of the time. Really weird things. Oh, and of course we were rowing the North Pacific, so always make sure that we actually have some photos of, of both of us rowing. We did do an awful lot of this. It did get very boring. It gets horrible when it's the middle of the night and you've got to wake up in two hours time for your 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. shift and you know you're not going to see the sun because it's getting towards winter. So the sun will start to come up at maybe eight or nine o'clock. Um, we were out there for such a phenomenally long period of time that I started to notice that we must be getting towards winter again because I could start to see the plough in the sky, whereas previously the, the, earth, the earth had been tilted in a slightly different direction because it had been summer, and so I hadn't seen it. And so we were starting to notice things on a sort of a global scale, a celestial sta scale. Um, and that's quite scary when you realise that we've actually been out there and rode round over a quarter of the world in terms of numbers of degrees and angles and things. It was a really big trip. And it really puts you in your place in the world to see, to look up at night and see the Milky Way moving from behind my left shoulder. And then if it's midnight-ish, it'll be sort of due south and then it'll start to come round um, by, sun, by the time the sun comes up in the morning and then to watch the stars slowly be blinked out as the, the blue sky comes in for the morning. Uh, and to watch an amazing sunrise like this that isn't just taking up this much of the screen, it's being reflected by the sea and it is a full 360 degree panorama of colour and beauty. It is fantastic and I always tried to take a, a 30 seconds, a minute, even though yeah, we've got to keep rowing, we've got to keep moving, you just got to take time to really enjoy those amazing moments, um, and I know that I did that when I was I did the uh, CTS in uh, Eastbourne, and like it was a beautiful day, and I was still running, not very fast, admittedly, but I can't really run that fast anyway. Um, but you just take that moment to go, wow, I'm really lucky to be here, and really lucky to have this opportunity and be in this situation to enjoy this moment. Um, and always try and take those moments because those are so powerful and, uh, and beautiful. That's what makes life worth living, really, is those, those moments of, of exceptional beauty and enjoyment and reflection. Now, we'd been rowing two hours on, two hours off, stopping for bad weather, rowing two hours on, two hours off, two hours on, two hours off, and slowly, slowly, those small steps had added up to, hey, we've, look at that, that's Japan, here we are, this is fantastic, we've come a long way, but there is an awful long way to go, and I've got to say, you never open the map from where you want to get to and then look backwards, because that is just really scary. 
Um, at least look at where, where you've done first. I mean, this must have been, what, uh, 100 or so days in. We've passed the international date line. Brilliant. We're looking fantastic. But there's still a couple of thousand miles to go before we hit to, hit America. So back to it. Oh, uh, there's some pretty pretty bad weather coming through now. So we got four days of, you know, the sort of rain we've had over the last couple of days. Sort of that times two, maybe three. I mean, it would just be, you couldn't, it, it would hurt. I had to have my hood like completely pulled down. My, my uh, wrap around on my jacket pulled right up beyond my nose. And even then my eyes were still being stung by the rain. It was just amazingly uh, heavy. Um, but you just got to tackle it head on. There's no other way of dealing with it. You just got to go, okay, fine. It's going to rain. If I wait in, inside five minutes, it'll still be raining when I get out. So let's just tackle it head on. You know, yeah, the cabin is going to be wet and soggy and miserable and minging for the next couple of days. Let's just crack on with it. And I think humour helps an awful lot because when you're outside, you know that there's somebody inside who's uh, really enjoying being nice and warm and cosy. <laughs> Uh, and I have to say, I can only show this picture because I gave Mick the idea because I took it first. And and like I said, humour does play a massive part in in any sort of uh, trip or voyage like this. Uh, from stupid haircut photos to dressing the volleyball up as a girlfriend in the uh, survival outfit. It's really important within any team that you really um, maximise your individual strengths. So Mick uh, is an ex-Marine. He's been a professional skipper for the last however long. He really knows his stuff when it comes to boat stuff and the things that you have to do. So he was in charge of writing the log. He was in charge of GPS um, and making sure that like the things were being done right. He knew how to call boats on the VHF. I mean, I know that I know how to and I can do, but I'm not as relaxed and as calm as, as, as Mick is in those sort of situations. So he's, he's the go-to guy for boat stuff. Um, I'm the go-to go -to guy for mechanical and electrical problems. So uh, when your sat phone isn't talking to your computer and you can't send any emails, you look at the cable and work out that it's, it's definitely this cable that isn't working. And then you try and work out where in the cable there is a problem and there's a small little bit of extra sealant here that I had to stick on to make sure it was working. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I am a DIY god, get in. <laughs> but it did take an awful long time and every single day after this it was, da -da 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 -da. okay I'll just have the patience just to go through this and spend 20 minutes when I could be sleeping and I really should be. Just got to send this extra email out, send this extra message, make sure that we just maintain that rhythm of what we were doing and how we were doing it. Um, and this extended throughout the boat. There's, we had some issues, far fewer than we'd had previously because of that preparation that we'd done. Um, but when a solar panel stops working, what do you do? You've got to try and find out where that problem's come from. So you take everything apart and sit there fixing it. And instead of sleeping, you're there mending stuff. And that's the only way you can make sure you're you're in good shape. And I think the there's the one thing that this trip taught me as a life lesson is that it isn't just my idea that's necessarily the best idea. There are always more than two ways to solve any problem. And this is my solution to the fact it was roasting hot and very, very sunny outside. I used my sleeping bag inner, a old t-shirt, and formed some sort of bizarre caftan rope. Mick came up with a much better solution of just tying up the towel, which dried the towel and uh, didn't use up his sleeping bag inner. Maybe, uh, maybe he's got some good ideas. I don't know. <laughs> The one problem that we hadn't really anticipated facing uh, was a food shortage. We'd taken well over six months worth of food with us. But because uh, of the bad weather, because uh, some of the packs of food had started to leak, um, so essentially we'd had a whole load of watertight hatches on deck. Beneath them was stored all the food. Some of the water had made its way into those hatches. 
Um, we tried to pump it out. We hadn't been able to pump out all of it. And it doesn't take much, but just a little bit of salt water for six months will slowly eat through a sealed pack of food like this. Um, and so we'd start to open up breakfasts and breakfasts would be off and bright green. I'm like, okay, well, I'll go eat that one then. And then this happened sort of more and more frequently as we got, got on. And so we started to eke out our food supply and think, well, maybe we need to sort of start planning for for a longer trip than we were anticipating. The weather had turned. I mean, we were expecting four and a half months. We'd taken food for six. And now some of this food was starting to be, starting to go off. So we were starting to get really thin. This is Mick at the beginning of the trip. Uh, this is day one. This is Mick day 185. Uh, we'd lost a lot of weight. I mean, we lost nearly 25 kilos each and Mick had it to lose. I was, I just didn't have it. I was going, I've still got some biceps there. I'm looking good. <laughs> we'll go with that. Um, and so unfortunately, we were aiming to be unsupported all the way across. Now, there's no support yacht, but we were aiming not to have to take any food on. Unfortunately, we realised that wasn't going to be the case. We'd had our last meal on board. We consumed the last rations, which was uh, half a cup of soup between two of us and a hot strepsil in some water. Uh, that was the day before um, this next shot. Uh, and so we phoned up our land support and said, OK, do what you can, sort us out with some sort of, some sort of food drop. Best day of my life when this boy turned up, I tell you, it was fantastic. The best thing you can imagine having been hungry for about three months, because even though you try to eat as much as you can, you've got limited food supply. This, uh, this chopper turns up and you know that you've pre-ordered a, a Big Mac and fries, and it turns up. There is, n I, I now religiously have uh, a Big Mac and Fries on November the 9th uh, to commemorate this day and Wayne Lackey dropping us four boxes of food. Um, from there we were within helicopter range of land so we really weren't that far away. It was gutting to have to take it but I've got to say absolutely no regrets whatsoever. Um, and a few days later you might just be able to see this is... That is a coastline, uh, and that's the coastline of America. So after 189 uh, days, we then rode round Reyes Point uh, in between a naval test area and three shipping lines coming in and out of San Francisco, threaded ourselves in between probably about a mile or two mile wide stretch of sea in order to get under the, the lee of these cliffs here uh, and rode round the corner and in the morning the next day, we, we were there to be able to witness the sun come up underneath the Golden Gate Bridge and row underneath it and shake hands and say, nice job, mate. Very well done. I think that's very good. Uh, and so I'd like to sort of announce in terms of, uh, well, people, people always say, what next? And I'm like, well, there's a couple of things, really. Firstly, anything is possible. If you reach a little higher and you believe in yourself and you have that level of self-belief. Um, and, and secondly, we're on Discovery Channel on Thursday at nine o'clock. So please do watch us. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, did anyone get that plug? Maybe I should try again. Um, and thirdly, is my next big project is uh, setting up a Pacific rowing race. Not that route, I'd like to say. It's a lot shorter. It's about 2,000 miles. It's from California. It finishes in Hawaii. Um, what a fantastic thing to do if you've been touched or been excited by the idea of rowing an ocean. Uh, please come and see me afterwards or have a look at the website and get in touch. And thank you very much for listening. <laughs>